first, uh, my grandparents uh, came over from uh, Czechoslovakia, the Bohemia in particular, and then uh, that's on my dad's side and on my mother's side. Uh, they had quite a variety of different people that came over. They had from uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, France, and that. So it was a big mixture of people. And they came back, oh, in, in the 1700s is when they came over. And then um, I was born in uh, South St. Louis and uh, went to grade school there, high school, and Washington U College. And then after I got out of college, I got a job at McDonald Aircraft Company. And I worked there for about a year getting experience in that. And then there was an opportunity to go to uh, another state for a job. They wanted me to go to Huntsville, Alabama. And I said, well, I'm not too interested about that. How about sending me down to Florida where, the, where they launched the spacecrafts? And they says, you got it. <laughs> so off to Florida I went. Uh, I uh, got married right before I left, <laughs> so it was our, we always said it was our nine-year honeymoon living in Florida. <laughs> so when I got down there, uh, we got a place to live down there in Titusville, Florida, which was just about 20, 25 miles from Cape Canaveral. And um, they, they told us right away, they said, we never have hurricanes down here very, very often. So first thing we had, to, if we were there a few weeks, we had our first hurricane. <laughs> so we survived that. And then went out to um, work at the launch pads. And my first job was work on a Atlas booster. That's an intercontinental ballistic missile. And they were adapting it to the Mercury spacecraft to see if it would work. And my job was to um, what we called a Freon cart. We'd pump Freon up to the spacecraft to keep it cool while it was on the launch pad. So um, they said, okay, we're getting ready to launch, but we don't want you to go too far because you go too far and we have a hold. We want you to get back here so the spacecraft don't overheat. So instead of going out to the safe area, we were in closer, about halfway out, and I was sitting there with the destruct crew, and then the um, booster launched, and um, all of a sudden, looking straight up overhead, the thing exploded, <laughs> and there was pieces of sheet metal coming down like samurai swords, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and the big flame up there and everything, and then all of a sudden the engines hit the ground, and we actually went <laughs> from the impact. We were that close. <laughs> Tell me again what year that, that was and what That was 1960. So this is before any manned mission. Right. We were testing the adapter that adapted the Atlas booster to the Mercury capsule, and the Mercury capsule was going to go into orbit. So that adapter failed on that booster. So we recovered the spacecraft in bushel baskets. <laughs> of parts. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time, but I noticed I was all alone at the launch pad when they were launching. And that was because the booster was fully loaded with fuel. And if it would explode, it would have wiped out me and everybody, everything else around me. <laughs> so those are, the, those are the good old days. Yeah, the good old days. So, so this is probably, um, a lot. Is it, did, maybe you can just say a few words about back then. There, you were building the program from scratch, right? Right, right. We we always felt like we were uh, back in the Model T days, just creating something from scratch that's never been done before. And uh, our motto was, "We'll do uh, the difficult right away. The impossible will just take a few more days." <laughs> And uh, most of the launch team were all pretty young people in their 20s. They didn't realize all the things that you couldn't do. <laughs> so we did what you couldn't do because we didn't know any better. <laughs> How old were you back then? I was uh, 22 when I went down there. <laughs> then how many were you in the, in the team that you worked with? Let's see, totally 
I think there was 600 people from McDonald down there. And that was the engineers, management, the production people, the people that actually launched the spacecraft. And the, so um, it was a fair complement of people. So let me, let me ask you, before you go further into this, into your stories about NASA, I'm assuming that uh, some people had roles and titles that were more defined. Right. What, did you have a defined role or, or set of duties, or were you a, like a free-floating person that did a lot of things? Right. Well, in, in my case, since I just got out of school, I wasn't there for all the development of everything. So I was, like you say, a free floater. And anytime somebody needed something done, they'd say, hey, Ed, come here, <laughs> do this. Yeah, whenever they needed something dangerous done. They yeah, anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, as an example, another little dangerous thing is on the second Atlas launch, I was uh, going through the launch countdown and that, and uh, uh, we had a hold, and they says, okay, everybody break for lunch. So we broke for lunch, and then when I came back, the equipment I was working on had exploded while I was gone. So I'm not quite sure I would have survived that explosion. <laughs> so anyway, then they, redesigned the equipment and got somebody else to do it. So then I was off on other things. But I had a, they, they decided I was the air conditioning expert. So and whenever anything to do with air conditioners came up, I was the one. <laughs> we had uh, tractor trailer trucks, the 18 wheelers, and they was full of electronic gear, like communications. And uh, then we had big air conditioners that powered them and the, these trailers go out to the launch pad and then check out the spacecraft out there. <laughs> it's not like like you see at uh, Houston nowadays where they got all the equipment in one big room. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, if you went up on the uh, gantry on the Atlas, it looked like an old oil derrick is what it looked like. And here you're standing up, I don't know how many hundreds of feet up you are, and you look down, and there's this little bitty chain between you and falling down, and I've seen bigger dog chains than what that chain was. So how far down would you fall? Oh, it was well over 100 feet. <laughs> so just a little, a little chain goes across the open, right. open area. And it was just nothing there. <laughs> I mean, you're working up there. Right. So what kinds of things do you do way up there? Well, we were, uh, we were, checking out the cabling that goes to the spacecraft to make sure that it was all working properly. And uh, uh, we'd run tests to, to make sure the circuits were right before they hooked up the spacecraft. And then uh, one of the interesting things here, I'm looking at the spacecraft, which is the most modern thing at that time. And I look over at the ocean and here's a skeleton of a of a, of a small ship or boat with just the ribs set up there washing up on the beach. It's kind of a contrast between the old and the new. <laughs> Tell me how you thought that your education meshed with the sorts of things that you were actually doing in NASA. Were you, were, could you have anticipated any of this stuff when you were back in school? And maybe just a little more about what you studied in school. Well, and I studied electrical engineering and they gave us a full dose of how to build uh, circuits with vacuum tubes. And uh, I had never built a circuit with vacuum tubes for my whole life after that because everything went to transistors and integrated circuits. So other than having the experience of being able to do something complex, <laughs> that's what I got out of college. So you're starting over. Right. <laughs> So, so did you build circuits at NASA, or did, did you... Well, them? at first I got into this mechanical engineering group. That was the only opening they had. And um, one of the big things was they had this enormous power supply, which supplied the power to the spacecraft. And uh, there was a lady driving in downtown Cocoa Beach, and she ran into an electric pole and it broke one of the wires on the electric pole. 
and that wire happened to be the control circuit for that power supply. And the power supply at that time was hooked up to some equipment that was simulating the spacecraft, and it just literally burnt everything up. They even had tubes in there, and they just melted in their sockets. So it was, yeah. an, off, it was an off site auto accident. Right. Ruined a lot of equipment. Right. <laughs> So then they gave me my first first job of any consequence, and that was to build a power source for the spacecraft that couldn't damage the spacecraft. So they said, okay, the first thing you do, go out in the junkyard out there and see what's out there. <laughs> so I found this big trailer, <laughs> and it was used to haul big spools of cable to the spacecraft to, to run between the spacecraft and the blockhouse. And it was just crap now. So I had them cut down the chassis to make it small, which caused the wheels to stick way out. And then I built the center part and put uh, uh, four banks of truck batteries in there. And then took that power supply and used it to power the batteries, but no battery could be charged while it was connected to the spacecraft, so it was totally safe. And the way the design of that thing came out, it was like a box with a flat top, and then in the front, where the tongue goes to connect to the truck, I had their electrical connectors, so I put a little shelf there, so to protect the electrical connectors from all the salt water and that that was there. And when it was done, they nicknamed it the stagecoach <laughs> because it, with the big wheels sticking out, that looked like a stagecoach. And they used that uh, for all the Mercury capsule launches. And then after the launches were over, they brought it to St. Louis, and I don't know how many years they used it here. <laughs> so it was a very serviceable thing. So there were, the Mercury missions were how many about? Oh. It includes uh, Scott Carpenter first. Yes. Yeah, it was, uh, Glenn. yeah, let's see, <laughs> uh, not Scott Carpenter, he was later. John Glenn was the first one to orbit. Right. Uh, why can't I think of the, the tall, thin guy? <laughs> uh, anyway, when they had him in, the, they put him in an altitude chamber, and the spacecraft had a, a periscope. So then they would take him up to altitude and make sure the spacecraft doesn't leak in that. And uh, somebody put a Playboy centerfold underneath the, uh, the uh, uh, periscope so that when he got up there, hell he saw was a Playboy centerfold. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was Alan Shepard? Alan Shepard, yeah, right. <laughs> and then they went to uh, so John Glenn. Glenn. John Glenn was the first one that went into orbit. That was really the true, <laughs> true thing. What they did it was Alan Shepard. They used a, a Redstone rocket, which is a much smaller rocket, and all it could do was go up and come down as a ballistic shot. So theoretically, they did that because the Russians had already put a man in space, and they wanted to show everybody that we weren't that far behind. So they put the the redstone up. So the first that was the first mission. Yes. The redstone, just enough to get them into the space. Right. Let them fall back down. Right. It, about a 15 minute flight. So it was totally, totally. Uh, Propaganda. Not, not, not much of a purpose other than a political purpose. Right. But what was interesting is, before they launched him, they um, wanted to launch one redstone rocket with the full up mercury on it. So, for the first time in about 60 or 70 shots of that rocket, the plugs on the bottom came out in the wrong sequence. So uh, once the booster engine lit, it immediately had engine shutdown. So that signal went to the spacecraft, and the spacecraft says, hey, the engines are off. I can jettison my escape tower. So it jettisoned the escape tower. And then, uh, Barometer said, hey, we're below 10,000 feet. I can deploy the drogue chute. 
then they said, okay, we need to have the main chute come out. <laughs> so those all came out, and then they said, well, we need to put the die marker out, so they dumped the die marker out, <laughs> and it's still sitting on a launch pad. <laughs> so all the people that were on in communications and everything, they said, hey, we found the spacecraft. <laughs> it's on the launch pad. <laughs> because they were testing out their system. So, so it, when, the, when the escape uh, rockets went off, it did not take the capsule with it? No, no, because the proper sequence is once the booster engine shuts down, you don't need the escape tire anymore. The, the escape tire is only if the booster is blowing up, they want to pull you out of the way. <laughs> so all that happened, and the capsule still sitting on the launch pad. Launch pad. Who and, was in there? Huh? Who was in there? Nobody. Oh, it's just a test. But it was still powered up. So they had to pull the uh, gantry back, and then one guy climbed up the gantry while the rocket was already full of fuel and everything, and reached in the spacecraft and shut it off so that they could defuel the, the rocket. <laughs> anyway, that was a little, <laughs> a little different flight. <laughs> um, so. What I see next on your, your list, we have a list here. Um, you were watching an Atlas launch from the adjacent blockhouse. Right. And the fog made it look. Yeah, let's see. Something. Yeah, we, the blockhouses were like a, a dome. And maybe they were six feet thick or eight feet thick. I don't know how thick they were, but they were huge. And they were. Maybe you could lay it out for people who don't know how that was. So there's a, <laughs> there's a rocket out, way out yeah. from you, anybody. Yeah, about a. Mm, Maybe a thousand feet away from the from, from the blockhouse. Okay, and then the blockhouse is a highly protected right. structure, and that's where the, the closest people normally are. Well, that's the ones that are pressing the launch button. Is are that they the closest ones to? The yeah, launch? they're the closest ones. Okay, and then how many people are in that area? Oh, well, the blockhouse was fairly big uh, because you had the booster systems as well as the spacecraft systems. <laughs> I never did. Uh, just I so. could visualize the, the size of the blockhouse and maybe 30 people, I don't know. All right. and, then, and then farther back from the rocket, there's a lot more other, other people in other buildings. Oh, yeah, yeah. then you got, you got the mission control room and then you got Houston takes over after it, after it gets up and flying, then okay. the Houston so, takes over. So I'm just over. trying to get an idea. So when you watch this Atlas launch from the blockhouse, you were about 1,000 feet away? Oh, no. Well, it was on the adjacent, uh, the next pad over. And it was um, uh, let's see. Each blockhouse had a blockhouse, and then a thousand feet away was where the launch site was. And then you go over to the next one, the next blockhouse, and maybe that was a couple of miles away. Right. So it was middle of the night, about midnight. We were on the night shift, and we said, "Hey, we're going to go watch that Atlas launch on the next pad." So you could see it there, the countdown and everything. And then all of a sudden, when the engines lit off, you had that big orange glow, but the fog had rolled in. So the whole sky immediately turned orange. <laughs> and you ought to see the running for the door of the black house. <laughs> In fact, uh, one guy broke his leg because <laughs> he was on a, on a small building and he ran off of it. <laughs> Then the uh, the blockhouse they they checked it out. They had an escape tunnel that you could go out underneath it, and they says we need to check that out to see if you can really get out there. So they went and they checked it out, and it had a bunch of rattlesnakes in it. <laughs> so <laughs> they had to clean that out before they. <laughs> so uh, so you mentioned also something about the Atlas Centaur. Oh, the Atlas Centaur, you know, uh, when you go see a, a fireworks display, you say, oh, ooh, and all that. But until you saw $100 million worth of Atlas and Centaur blow up, you haven't seen anything yet. The Atlas had a kerosene oxygen fuel mixture, which was burned orange when it had that big fireball. And then the Centaur, had a hydrogen oxygen and it turned almost black red burning so he had this huge orange fireball come up and then out of it punched the uh, black red centaur blowing up <laughs> <coughs>
And it's the type of thing when you feel this thing's launched, you got you feel this on your chest. <laughs> um, so then you mentioned a redstone mercury, uh, an abortion, an aborted mission. Well, that was one I said before about okay. the, the escape tire. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and then you mentioned something about a, a big fixture coming loose. Oh, right. Uh, with Leo? Yeah, with Leo and Gene. Yeah, we, they had a room inside the hangar and they would put the spacecraft in this big fixture and then they would tilt it one way or the other to see if the gyro sensed the right direction. So they were all done with that and we were finished winding down on the Mercury program. So they says, okay, you need to take that fixture out of there. And the fixture is big. I mean, uh, the mercury was was almost a ton, so the the fixture was strong enough to hold that. So they were they take the roof off of this little building inside, and then they Gene was using the the crane to lift up that fixture, and one of the uh, cables broke, and it started swinging like a pendulum, and two by fours were going crack crack crack. It just falling out of the way. So then Leo and me, we were directing him on how to go. And we saw that, we ran for the doorway. We got stuck in the doorway because we hit it at the same time. <laughs> so we're in the wrong place. How, how many times over the years when you were down there? Well, first of all, how many years were you actually down there in Florida? Let's see, I got down there in 1960 and came back, what was it, in 67? So in seven, seven years, years, or six or seven years, how many times do you think you were in a rather dangerous situation? Well, there's a, 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 I don't know, I told you about the atlases, you know, being there fueled and, and that, and then the Freon cart blowing up and uh, so many other things I had, they had high pressure oxygen and I had to uh, put temperature sensors on that to, to make sure what the temperatures were. and. Uh, this pressure is so high that they used the lower pressure at Rala to carve out the granite um, uh, stone hedge that they got down there. So that pressure, if it got to you, you'd just be gone. <laughs> just cut you right in half. But what's, what, what's your gut feeling though? How many times were you thinking that your life was, pre pre life was precarious for you based upon something going on in the program? Oh. Was it at least 10? It could have been because there's other times where they, they on some of those trailers I was working on, the trailers weren't working, and they had removed the ground wire from the cable, uh, from the trailer, so then you had 208 volts sitting on a trailer, so if you would have touched something, you would have been zapped because the whole frame was high voltage. <laughs> were, were there many people uh, getting injured or killed? In, uh, in no, no, nobody got injured or killed but there was quite a few things that blew up over <laughs> the time. <laughs> was, that, was that rather surprising that no one got hurt? And, yes, uh, it was, because there wasn't, you didn't have all the safety precautions you had later on because nobody knew what was going on because this was the first time you ever did it. And who was, who was your boss? Who, who, who did you look to or was, did that change over the years? Well, that changed over the years. First I had, uh, my boss was, uh, uh, a mechanical engineer and uh, so I got assigned to his group because he was a charter person. So I did a lot of mechanical engineering stuff and fluids and gases and stuff like that. So by being in that group I got a huge amount of background information which really helped me later on in my career. And he also was upset with me because his friend was supposed to come down instead of me and I came down in place of him. So he said, he assigned me every job he could. <laughs> so I had really hundreds of jobs that I had, little jobs that I had to do, and um, which was really good <laughs> because when a Gemini program came along, there was a guy in a Gemini program and he says, he came over and he says, would you work for me? And I says, why did you pick me? And he says, you're the only one in that group that does all the work. <laughs> and I'm assuming that when you had all those jobs, this is not a 40 hour a week job. Oh, okay. They, uh, uh, 
we had the great bologna sandwich get together. The company called all the wives and family out and we went out and they fed us bologna sandwiches and soda. And they said, okay, we're here and we want to tell you that you're not going to see much of your husbands anymore because we're going to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> and they sued us with bloaty sandwiches. <laughs> but that didn't last very long because uh, there were some guys who I really respected and thought they were really outstanding people. And they had worked so long and hard on it without getting enough rest that things started blowing up on them. <laughs> and the company finally decided that, hey, maybe we shouldn't do the 12 hour day, seven days a week. So then I think they hired a hundred extra people to, <laughs> to fill in for them. <laughs> so break it down into, Mercury lasted from when to when? Uh, it lasted about two and a half years. So that was about 62 or something like that. That's when it, when it ended in 62? Yeah, 60, uh, roughly, yeah. Because I thought, I thought John Glenn went into space right around Well, yeah, well they, they had a bunch of flights, but it could have been 63. I don't know the exact date. Uh -huh. But then Gemini came after that. Right. And that was about how many years? It was about six months later after the Mercury program was over. How long did Gemini last? Oh, that was about another, well, it lasted until 67, so it was a couple of years. All right. And then it was at the end of your stay in Florida? Right. After, after Gemini. So you came back to St. Louis after that. Right. So all your stories are going to be from that seven-year period, either Mercury or Gemini. Um, well, I also got Skylab, but that's oh, Skylab. okay. Good, we'll get we'll get into all that. <laughs> okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to take a, uh, like a, a quick break here. I want to break these into 30 minute chunks. Okay. Rather than have a, a big thing. So, okay. So, you had a lot of difficult precision work to do, and of course, you use your pocket calculators and your PC computers to get it done, right? Yeah. That is that's called slide rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's, knowing, you know, it's like you have a complicated. Uh, derivative equation. There's okay. no, there's no way to, to get it done except your slide rule. Or the slide rule, paper. right? This, okay. this trial and error. In fact, uh, one time, <coughs> uh, my wife liked mathematics, so I had to uh, design a split phase converter attenuator, and it had to have all matching impedances and everything, and it had a whole bunch of equations that you had to solve simultaneously to get the answer. So I told her that's what I was working on, and she says, can I do that? <laughs> and I says, you can do it, but you have to do one thing. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was her background? Well, she, she was an architectural engineer. <laughs> okay, and so did she? She loved math, equation? yeah, yeah. She solved the equation, it took a couple of days to do it, which was good. If I would have done it, it would have took me a couple of days to do it. <laughs> And uh, so how was that equation then used? How, what, what did it help get done? Well, you have the, the signals coming off the spacecraft. Um, it's called telemetry. <laughs> and what telemetry is, it senses all different things. It tells you what all the pressures are and, and what's, what the temperatures are and, and all the fuel levels and everything. And then that would come down to the split phase continuator. Then one would go to the blockhouse and one would go to the mission control room. So then if that one thing failed, everybody would be offline. <laughs> so it was an important thing. <laughs> so did you have a relationship where you would occasionally consult with her about how hard something was and did she have some ideas for other things to get done too? Yeah, well, uh, in this, on the space program, they kept bringing up the point, nothing is classified. It's all out in the open. Of course, there was a few things that were classified, but that was like the details of how fuel cells operate and what the, that type of thing. Uh, but as far as launch things and these things I was working on, none of that was classified. So we would talk about things <laughs> and she enjoyed that. And, uh, and she had worked at McDonnell Douglas on missiles before she went down there. And she actually worked on a computer in 1960. It was a mechanical computer and you would select different gear ratios to compute trajectories of the missile. 
and that's what she, her job was. <laughs> but we didn't get electronic computers until way late. <laughs> Did you have any while you were in, in the space program at, at, in Florida? No. Okay, so, so everything you did, yeah. everything, in fact, was there like a mainframe computer that anybody got to use down there? Uh, no. <laughs> so everybody did all the work with paper and pencil or slide rule. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand this is off topic, but I understand that's how they built the arch, too. Yeah. They, they used slide rules and yeah, paper and pencil. In fact, uh, a lot of times you get more accurate results with a slide rule, even though it's inaccurate, because to work the slide rule properly, you kind of, in your head, figure out what the appropriate answer is, so you know where to put the decimal point. So when you get the answer, then you know where the decimal point goes. On a computer, if you make a mistake, the decimal point could be any place. If, if I hand you a slide rule right now, would you have a lot of that come back to you? That you well, I, I can multiply and divide with it. I don't know how I could, if I can remember how the tangents and sines and all that works. But I think I could probably come back with it pretty easily. Did mo most everybody carry one? Uh, well, down in Florida, not too much because we were more hands-on hardware down there. Although a lot of the calculations had already been done. So if, if something had to be done on the fly though, and if you had to pull it out, did you feel I mean, in a classroom, when you're doing problems on a chalkboard, if you get the problem wrong, you just your test score is a little less. But here, it could be a life loss. Oh, right, right. Something could blow up. You had to have it right. But you're doing it. You're doing it with a slide rule. Did, it, did you feel extra pressure? Slide, you know, doing the you know the calculations. You know, well, I think big were at stake? to be truthful, most of my calculations I did down there, I did by hand. <laughs> you know, it's a, like when I built that uh, thing that called the Sage Coach. I did that all by, you know, hand writing. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Um, yep, the, uh, the one thing we hadn't talked about was uh, President Kennedy coming down and giving us a pep talk. <laughs> and, you know, where I worked at, I worked at Hangar S, and then just inside the door is where my office was. <laughs> office is a loose word to say down there. You have a desk where you can put your lunch. <laughs> Otherwise, you're out at the launch pad or the block house or someplace else. You're very seldom at your desk. And right outside the door is where Kennedy gave us the speech on how important it was for us to do our job right and how we had to beat the Russians. And he gave us a priority two. <laughs> priority one was a strategic air command. They got things first. We got things second. <laughs> So that means materials and supplies. Right. If we needed a part, it suddenly appeared. Yeah. On the other projects, you might wait years for the part. So what was your logistics system for getting stuff down there? Did the, did the military bring it down for you? Or how did, how did, they get, how did you get what you needed? Well, they, they had a, a system set up. It went through the company and that, and they had it set up. Uh, I, you know, I think we went through NASA. What I had personally is they gave me a credit card. <laughs> And I went down to Patrick Air Force Base and I would design something and I knew what it had to be. So I'd go through and pick out the parts and make sure they all fit right and everything. And then I would charge them out and then come back and give them to the shop people and they'd build the stuff for me. <laughs> so that's how, <laughs> how quickly we could build something. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the uh uh, well, first of all, did you, did you get to meet President Kennedy? Did you get close to him when he was there? Well, he was about uh, maybe 15 feet away from me. Okay. <laughs> but there was a crowd of Secret Service people and that, and he shook the first roll and left. <laughs> what, what was his tone? Was this, this is really pretty serious stuff to, to beat the Russians, wasn't it? Yeah, he was all, he, uh, well, I can't remember the exact words, but the impression I got is that we need to work hard and show that we're capable of getting into space. And Back then, were you, you weren't oblivious to the political world as you were. Oh, no, in fact. You, you knew the Cold War was going on. What, what was your thought about how, how this would affect the country? Were, were, you, were you motivated by that? Well, what it was is, uh, in all reality, I don't think Kennedy cared about space that much. He just wanted to beat the Russians. <laughs> 
fact, years later it came out that that was the only reason he went <laughs> to the moon <laughs> was to beat the Russians, not that it was a political thing. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, it was just politics to get there, <laughs> not scientific. Uh, um, okay, so uh, I'm just looking at your list. The company gave a launch party for only the people in the Black House? Yeah, on the, on the uh, Mercury project, the uh, upper management, and then there was just a few people in the Black House and they would have a, a, a small party. And then the hundreds of other people, we'd go to another hotel in Cocoa Beach and have our lunch party, which was a fairly crowded party. And then one time they, they baked a cake, the full size of the spacecraft, and they wheeled it in. <laughs> and they had the news people there. And they says, okay, everybody stand around the spacecraft cake and there wasn't enough people <laughs> to cover it so upper management came to our party and they said please would you guys come over to our party <laughs> to show that you could stand around the cake <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the lunch parties you, you know the astronauts were there and uh, all the upper management you know it's a the um Okay, the company decided, okay, we, we already talked about the seven days a week. Uh, NASA wanted to see if a rescue vehicle could be parked near the launch pad. Yeah, they had a, on the uh, Titan, the Titan II is what uh, was a space, uh, was the booster that uh, launched the Gemini. It was a bigger, heavier booster. <laughs> a lot more reliable and everything. <laughs> and they wanted to see if they could park a truck there that they could have an escape crew there that would, if the astronauts had to get out of the spacecraft right away, they would be there to haul them off. So they parked the truck there and the first time the truck, when it took off, the truck just rolled away from the launch pad, you know, and aside from rolling. So then the next launch, they strapped it down and then it burnt up. <laughs> so then they didn't have a rescue vehicle. <laughs> They had a, a slide, a slide for life, that you could hook onto it and you would slide away from the launch pad. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I, I want to go back one step. You, you mentioned in your outline uh, something about hiding the stagecoach when Kennedy came down. Yeah, yeah. They, well, the, the so stagecoach did, did not look like a modern <laughs> thing. I was wondering that if it just looked ugly. It well, was, it looked like a stagecoach. Okay. <laughs> and uh, everybody says, you know, everything else was latest state of the art and everything. But stagecoach was practical, but not beautiful. <laughs> so they hit it. <laughs> and then hauled it back out. When yeah, and then they hauled it back out for the launch. Kind of like the ugly duckling. <laughs> right. So next time you, you make one, you, you, you know to Get it more. Get a design engineer in. Get a get an aesthetic uh, oh, arti artist, artist in there. But the thing is, is there you always had one thing. You had a time crunch. You couldn't take a lot of time to do anything. Sure. You had to do it now. <laughs> um. So tell me about the time you sat in a Gemini spacecraft. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, I wanted to <clears throat> see how I fit in the Gemini spacecraft. So. They didn't have the contour couch in there. So they had, that That would have made it a little smaller. So I climbed into it and I sat down and I couldn't get the hatch closed because it hit my head. <laughs> so if I bent my head over, I could get the hatch closed. So I was too tall for my head to my rear end to sit in it. Those where, guys were always shorter in that respect. Where, where was the capsule at that time? Was it on a rocker? Rocket or uh, no, it was in the hangar. But on a, before it went out there, it was in one of the fixtures that we were tumbling in that to see if it, the gyros were working. So, so here's something I'm, I'm always wondering. This is really carefully designed and manufactured equipment, and I keep wondering when they're moving it, lifting it, and moving it. There's always a danger someone's going to bang an end of it or damage it. How, how hard was it to move? You must have seen them moving some things. How, how difficult was that to make sure you didn't damage things when you're assembling 
the capsules on the rockets and so forth? Well, they had, uh, you had a lot, a lot of really experienced crane operators. <laughs> they knew how to do things and they could operate those buttons and go a <laughs> little at a time. They knew how to do it. And they were extremely careful. <laughs> did, it, did anything ever happen where you, something was just about to be, you know, the day before the launch and then something got dinged on the side and you had to cancel it? And no, no. It's a, so all through the program, it, yeah. it, it, it worked. Yeah. How, how long before a launch was the whole rocket assembly with capsule ready and, and physically on the pad? Well, I think they had a several day countdown that you had to go through to uh, get to launch. And you had to check each system, make everything work, that it worked from the booster to the spacecraft and back. You know, so it uh, was a quite extensive check. So the countdown, I, we're all familiar with the ten, last 10 seconds, but he went days before that. Right, and, well. And maybe even weeks where they were assembling chunks of the rocket. Well, yeah, it depends where you want to start the countdown. I mean, like you had, on the Mercury, you had the retro rockets, and you had to line the retro rockets before you put the spacecraft on the booster. <laughs> so is that part of the countdown? <laughs> um, In fact, that was one thing that John Glenn had is the spacecraft um, had the retro rockets strapped on the bottom. And when you're in orbit, they jettison the retro rockets. And then it comes in and there's a heat shield there. And then when the spacecraft got real close to the water, the heat shield was released and a cylinder of, was there with holes in it. So that when you had the impact, the air would come out those holes and, and uh, cushion the impact. Well, in John Glenn, they had thought there was a, a micro switch which failed, which said that the heat shield had come loose, but it hadn't. So they came in with the retro rockets attached to it. I don't know, that was a, a big thing at, in those days. And, and now all it was was a bad switch. <laughs> um, let me go back to the, the slide roll one more time, because that seems like an incredibly difficult thing to do, to decide where you do your burn to slow, the, if the rocket's already in orbit, you're gonna bring it down now. Yeah. And to bring it down in a particular place in the ocean where the boats can get to it, the ships can get to it in time. So that was all done with slide roll too, right? When did when well, start the burn? Well, that. I think a lot of that was uh, <laughs> uh, they. I think they used three-dimensional partial differential equations to figure that out, and that was probably all done longhand. <laughs> and what it was is as the three dimensions was side side up and down and then they monitor how fast the rocket fuel was burning and how the weight of the uh, booster was getting lighter as it went up and then all that was figured in to get your trajectory. So when John Glenn orbits three times and they he's up here they're going to decide to start burning. Yeah. Do they know how, how precisely do they know when they start that burn? about where he's going to be. Is it like a hundred mile square or is it, is it something else? Like is it much bigger or smaller? Well, it's, uh, I think unknown to a lot of people, the astronaut could guide the, the capsule. You know, if he, he had a footprint, maybe, maybe it's a hundred miles, but he could guide that spacecraft. And what it, what it was, you had the heat shield on the back and the center of gravity was over here. And if you came in, the air here would push the spacecraft over. And if you're going too far the other way, you'd slide the center of gravity, rotate it to get the center of gravity the other side, and then it would come back. So they did have some guidance that they could use to zero in on. <laughs> so I, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, uh, tell me about the angry alligator. Okay, um, this is on the uh, Gemini project. And when you go to work down there, you have no idea what you're gonna do. <laughs> you may go home at three o'clock in the day or you may go home at midnight, you know, what the heck, what, what's going on? 
So they came by and they says, we got a, a Gina rocket <laughs> and we got the contract to put the shroud on the rocket, on the Agena. Tell me what a shroud is. It's, it's the nose cone. And there was a steel belly band around it and it had explosive bolts on it. And when the explosive bolts got ignited in orbit, they would go away and then shroud would go away. So our job was you could only put so many thousand pounds of strain in that band. So we had strain gauges all the way around it and we had to equalize that, that strain. And unbeknownst to us, we didn't know how to do it. So they gave us a 20 pound bag of lead shot and we'd take it and hit the side of the fiberglass nose cone <laughs> and it would warp and let the band move around a little bit until we got it down to the right pressure all the way around. So I think it took us 12 hours to do that. Unbeknownst to us is if you put silicon grease on it, you don't need to do that. But nobody knew that <laughs> because it was another company's thing and they, they didn't get the project. So when we're all done, I see two connectors hanging down and I says, those must be the connectors for the explosive bolts. And uh, one thing you never do, you never do something on your own. You only do it by procedure. <laughs> because if you would take off the sharding cap off of that explosive bolt, a stray voltage from somebody's transmitter or something could explode it. <laughs> so until the last minute, you connect it. So an inspector came up at the last minute and he looked it over for the last time and he says, hey, those connectors are hanging down. So he tied them up underneath so they wouldn't dangle. Instead of asking somebody, why are the connectors hanging down? <laughs> they had forgot that step in the procedure. So then when it got in orbit, the nose cone opened up in the front because it released the front, but it was stuck by that belly band. <laughs> so it looked like an alligator. <laughs> What, what effect did that have on the mission? Well, the primary thing, it, well, the company got fined $135 for it not opening properly. <laughs> and what they were trying to do is rendezvous with it. And the only thing they couldn't do was make a hard dock with it. <laughs> you know, but they, they found it in orbit and then they rendezvous with it. And that was the main mission that they were trying to do. Okay. Gemini was mainly the forerunner to Apollo. What can, you know, where they have the lem goes out and they dock with it. Gemini was doing that with the, the Agena. <laughs> lem, LEM stands for? Lunar Excursion Module. That was the, uh, uh, when they, they landed that on the moon. <laughs> um, okay, so where did Skylab come in, in in the midst of all this? Was that after Gemini? Yeah, after, after the moon uh, uh, program was over, they had some leftover hardware and they says, okay, we would like to make a space station. <laughs> so they took the upper stage of a Saturn V rocket and we made it into a space station. <laughs> so my job on that was they had this big shroud on the top. It, <laughs> it actually weighed 28,000 pounds, the, the, the nose cone. <laughs> and they also had solar rays on the side that they'd open up and then the solar rays would deploy. So electrically speaking, <laughs> that was my job to get all that stuff done. And uh, first you had to um, open up the meteorite shield, which would uh, be a sunshade and also for micrometeorites, it wouldn't penetrate the the side of the spacecraft. But there's a thing called max Q. That's when the air pressure is so great on the, on the booster and the vibration is so great, there's one point where that's the worst. And at that point, that meteorite shield ripped off. And as a result, pieces of it flew around and one of the pieces flew around and attached to the solar array, but it also broke the solar arrays loose. 
So when we went, when the when Skylab went into orbit, the uh, shroud, the payload shroud, had 220 foot long linear shape charges on it. And we ignited that and blew the segments apart. And the Apollo telescope mount rotated around and then it deployed its solar arrays. But when they separated, oh, I got a little ahead of myself. Before the shroud was, was jettisoned, they separated the booster from the Skylab, and it just so happened that one of the retro rockets was lined up with the solar array. And the solar array came up, flew up so fast from that rocket hitting it, it hit the shroud and flew off into space. It broke it off. And uh, I was uh, had worked a lot of years on the telemetry system, so I knew that that was what happened because I could figure it out. And then the other solar ray came out, but a little of the meteorite shield uh, bracketry had caught on it. So then the uh, astronauts had to go up there with a bone saw, <laughs> and they saw it. <laughs> it was just uh, like a wire thing, and they cut that off. <laughs> and then that one solar array came out and that's why you only see one solar array on the spacecraft on the Skylab. Oh, so there were supposed to be two? And there was only supposed to be one. Did the mission was the mission able to go forward? Well there was enough power in that one that it could do most of everything. You know, you just had to wait a little bit to get everything done. And then um, because the meteorite shield had ripped off, did this Skylab didn't have a sunshade, so it got real hot. So then one of the NASA guys uh, he got the idea that if you went through a, a hole where the uh, cameras went out, you could push out this umbrella type thing and then it opened up and then that kind of gold colored thing that you see on the Skylab is what he put on to keep it temperature down. <laughs> wow. So so on Skylab, you, you went to Houston, did, or you talked to the Houston people to help them? Yeah, the when, uh, when the, uh, in the early days when we were just learning about it. I went down to Houston and I explained to them how all the, everything that gets jettisoned, the cover for the refrigerator came off and then, then how the solar rays came out and how they deployed and how the meteorite shield came up and how the shroud came off and how the telescope. So I gave them their first shot at that. <laughs> I think you also have a topic, maybe it's the same one. You instructed the Houston flight controllers on how the Skylab works? Yeah, that's what, that, that's, that's the that was that thing, yeah. Yeah, later on, when the things got more refined, then they got each individual person who worked on it go down and tell them, but I gave them the overall thing in the beginning. So, how, how lucky do you consider yourself to have had a chance to work on that program? I think extremely lucky because <laughs> on the Skylab I got to design a lot of the circuits <laughs> and in fact uh, the one circuit that we did design for the, the jettison of the payload shroud they, they said they'd want to get a patent for it but uh, they said there's not many 28,000 pound shrouds that they need to jettison so they said it's not worth <laughs> So you graduated from school with a lot of other people yeah. with the same degree. Yeah. I'm, I'm not asking you to brag, but weren't they kind of jealous that you ended up in such an exciting place? Well, it's a, it's everybody has their own feeling about what's exciting. I've known guys that worked for McDonald for 35, 40 years, and they did one job in one place, never less their one desk. And I had the opportunity that I could go to other places and uh, do things that were was exciting. So what did you do when uh, when the Gemini was over in Skylab? Did you come back to St. Louis? You well, know, we designed Skylab in St. Louis. All right. So in 67 we came back to St. Louis and then I had got assigned to work on Gemini B which was an Air Force version of the Gemini but um, Nixon canceled that one. <laughs> so then I was in limbo for a little while, and then they said, okay, let's do the full up Skylab thing. So then I worked on that for several years. 
But the thing with astronautics is I loved astronautics. I liked spacecraft. I always, and when I was a kid, I had telescopes and everything that looked at the stars and that. And the kids would come over and say, hey, Ed, let's look at the moons of Jupiter or something. <laughs> and I always liked that. But you constantly had after Skylab, it was like, we got enough work for three months. And then in three months, well, we got enough work for another couple of months. And it got to me, and then I had an opportunity to go work on the aircraft. <laughs> so I says, okay, the aircraft is a steady job. What did you end up working on? The F-15. <laughs> okay, which was his own immensely successful. Right, and in fact... Uh, still, still in operation. Uh, yeah, and they're... Uh, I think their contracts, I think they got contracts out to 2018 yet for building. When did the program start? In uh, in 60, late 68 or something like that. So, anything else you want to add about your, your career at NASA? Oh, it's a, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, I learned a lot about pyrotechnics. We used to explode squibs and that just to see if they would work. You know, before the flight, they'd get a batch of 20 squibs in and then they would put a couple in the spacecraft and then we'd blow up a couple of them to make sure they worked right. A squib is what? Well, it's the thing that ignites, like a, like you have a guillotine and it cuts a wire bundle <laughs> and it, it ignites the thing. So that's, a, it, that's used to let go, of, have two pieces let go of each other? Yeah. And so it's, it's, not, it's not like plug and play where you have a little Extension cord. Oh, you no, no. Permanent wires that have to be chopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the, that was on the earlier spacecraft. I'm sure nowadays they probably got something different. But, And in fact, on the Gemini, you can see some of the wires, bundles trailing behind it like a tail. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else? Or uh, no, no. You could probably go on for a long time with, <laughs> with all the other experiences. Well, I think that is good. Yeah. About, I think it's about an hour. Yep. Yeah.